Nick Dacos was outstanding in 2024 and was duly rewarded by being acknowledged by all the AFL coaches in winning the AFL Champions Award. He goes into last night's Brownlow as a 50-50 sort of coin toss situation as to who might win. Is it Patrick Cripps? Is it Nick Dacos? And then we see Nick Dacos polls in 18 games. Polls 38 votes, which breaks the pre-existing record of 36 votes last held by Ollie Wines and Dustin Martin. And still doesn't win. He was up against a beast in Patrick Cripps and... I've said it in the, the video leading up to this when it came to who I thought would win. I said, Cripps puts on his cape just as much as Nick Dacos does for Collingwood and just does it in a different way. And in the end, they went for, they saw and could acknowledge and appreciate, I guess, the hardness of Patrick Cripps's game. But the issue herein lies with the Brownlow with the discrepancy in how much Cripps won by. He polled 45 votes. So for Nick, 38 votes wins you 97 Brownlows. So in 97 different Brownlows, 38 votes is enough. Not this time. So 45 votes. We talk about Cripps where he gets two votes for 19 touches against Essendon, subpar disposal efficiency that game. I just feel like at this point, the Brownlow is becoming a bit farcical. It's as ambiguous as the umpire's ruling interpretations are on the field. And think how crazy it is that you give the umpire the right or the responsibility to judge who is the best of field while trying to make these decisions on field as to what's right or wrong, who is breaching in-play rules. Look at it. Imagine if you, your referee in boxing also had to do the scorecards for the fight. You're never going to get consistent results. And is that the allure behind a Brownlow these days? Do people like tuning in because they know that the best player might not win? Because if that's the case, then it's just a, it's a reality TV show. This is a, yes, this is sports entertainment, but these outcomes and variables are all based on real things taking place. So why can't, the best player be awarded for their hard work and efforts. And, and I'm saying Patrick Cripps was the best player, right? That's fine. But the, the difference, how much he won by, is just a, a, a bad testament to what's wrong, everything that's wrong with the, the Browner. If we look at Lockie Neal last year, the same thing. That was ridiculous. And that was a real shock, a real left field for when it came came to light that he'd win the Brownlow in 2023. And then this year, he has half the the amount of votes that he, he accrued last year, despite having a better season statistically this year. But that's a, that's a different story. Yeah, I mean, for me, the Brownlow, it's a bit of a runway show, polluted with advertisements. You can even say, you can even probably suggest that the, the round-by-round sort of method of voting is flawed. You could, because you can make the argument that you might be the best player on the field 12 times, but if you're the worst player on field those other nine games that you play, it's redundant. Whereas I think that should matter in the grand scheme of things. If you're going to be dubbed the best player of the year, you need to be consistent across all the entirety of the season. But they reward you for having six or seven best on games and then you can be average or bad in the other games. But the that's the probably an argument that's going to rub against the tradi traditionalists. So it's not something I'm willing to, to die, a hill I'm willing to die on. But just for context, we look 18 players who got the full allotment of coaches votes in their games this year didn't get a vote in those games. They got that full allotment of the coaches votes. There are also 16 players who had no coaches' votes in a single game, and they polled. And I think they polled three votes in these games, and they were unrecognized by the coaches. So, what's the solution? Oh, I don't think it's clear cut. I think the lowest hanging fruit is allowing the umpires. If we want to keep the the culture and the tradition of what exists when when we tune into the brown and look forward to it. 
I think the easiest thing to do is just allow the umpires to perhaps look at the stats, re-watch the game, the highlights, extended highlights, maybe have them watch a 30-minute clip bite of the game so they can really ascertain what happened from quarter to quarter because in quarter four, that might, I guess, conflate what what you've seen over the the four quarters and, and confuse you as to, you know, for example, quarter four, Patrick Cripps might have had 10 disposals and kicked a goal, but then the other three quarters and he had four touches, but you base his his entire game off that fourth quarter. So it gets it gets a bit messy there. So I guess that's probably the low-hanging fruit. The other alternative, similar to the NBA, do you get a panel of, let's say, 100 panelists and get them to a lot votes, uh, a lot votes each week? And that those panelists can include legends of the 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 sport, highly regarded media journeys, have and, and they have access to the stats, they have access to the highlights. They're they're forced to watch X amount of games each week for consistency. And I, look, I say it's the midfielder's medal, but at the end of the day, your best players usually reside in the midfield, which is why, like, absolutely right. When we talk about a team. You want your midfield to probably to be the best part of your side. That's my opinion. I think you're going for Nick Dacos before you're going for Jeremy Cameron. You're probably going for Patrick Cripps before you're going for Charlie Kerno or Jacob Wiedering. That's the reality of it. So we got the forward medal. We got the Coleman medal. That's how we acknowledge the forwards. There needs to be a defensive MVP as well. So a little sub conversation there regarding today's discussion I think we need to acknowledge the best defender every year we need to acknowledge the best midfielder which we kind of do through the Brownlow and then we acknowledge the best forward through the Coleman medal maybe something a little bit more I think we we saw Hamish in that post the the speech for Patrick Cripps he referred that Tony Lockett kicked eight goals 26 times where he didn't receive the three votes so plenty to be spoken about when it comes to the Brownlow of late, what do we do to ensure that we're not getting unworthy winners? That wasn't the case this year, but I'm just talking about 45 votes versus 38. Geez, like what do you do? It's uh, it's an interesting conversation. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section. We'll go from there. Go Pies.